Good stuff, good stuff. Kara knocked it out of the park. It's good to see. I mean, this is what this is what we raise our leaders up to do, you know, to be equipped to do the work of the ministry. And we might surprise you and, and tap you on the shoulder and, and have you lead communion next time. It's silence. <laughs> Don't act so, so, so excited about it. Am I getting a little feedback or a little echo? Oh, that's better. Much better. Um, uh, before, I, before I pray and get started, I have, uh, I have another guest that I'm going to have come up and, and share. Um, I'll, I'll ask her up in a minute, Annie. Um, we, but we gather, we gather monthly for prayer, and it just so happens to be the first Sunday of the month this evening. And we gather together for corporate prayer. And what that is is when we gather together as, as a body, as a family, and storm the gates of heaven and scare hell. And uh, last, last corporate prayer was like unhinged. It was, it was wild. And for those of you who are there, you, you experienced that. So and those of you who won't, weren't there, get jealous that you weren't there. Um, but you have an opportunity to be there um, this, this evening. It's, it's a wonderful organized prayer time. You know, if you're thinking of corporate prayer, it's not like all chaotic and people just yelling out. It's very organized, and, uh, but it's a, just a really special time for us to, to gather together. And um, the way that we structure it is we, we kind of start with our own our, our Jerusalem, and then we work to Judea and Samaria. So our Jerusalem, we pray for the local congregation, the local body, the local family. We pray for other, uh, the other ministries and churches that we're, that we're connected with. And one of, the, one of the things that's personally been on my heart, and I don't think just on my heart, but everybody's heart, particularly the, the leadership, is that we begin to connect with, with the body of Christ, the larger C church in the city of, of Rochester. And um, we're living in very, very unique strategic times because we're praying very specifically and strategically. I, 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 there's something that's shifted in me where my, my, my prayers are, they, they've gone for the, from, from these general, you know, like shoot the prayer in the sky and however it lands, you know, awesome because God is good and he gives good gifts to his kids to really strategic stuff because I think the Holy Spirit's speaking to us, right? He's speaking to our hearts, speaking to our spirit. He wants to birth something new in us and new in the community. So he's going to give a specific instruction strategy and how to pray. And I, and I, and I, I feel like that that's, that's been happening in me and shifting in me. And uh, one of these things is, is that the Lord would begin to raise up the saints, not just here in the assembly, but raise up the saints to do the work of the ministry. And you know that we have a whole lot, there's a lot of area to grow, a lot of area to grow. Um, you know, we still have available seats in this, in this place, because there's supposed to be new souls, people that get saved, by, by us going out, doing what we're equipped to do in, in reaching the lost and impacting the world that we're, that we're in. And, uh, but one of the coolest things that I experience as a pastor and as a leader is when I hear about you and the things that, that you're doing and things that you're involved in, the answered prayer and, and the prophetic dreams and vision that God, God has given you. And... Um, one of the things, uh, another one of the things that we're praying for is, Lord, how, how can we begin to link, link with even other organizations and agencies that aren't, aren't necessarily religious structures or religious agencies, but are doing good work in the city? And how many know that there's a lot of good work out there that people are doing that aren't necessarily connected to the church, and they may not even believe, be, be believers, but everybody's created in the image of God. All mankind is created in the image of God. So there's goodness in every man and in every woman. I'm not talking about righteousness through Christ, but, but goodness. And there's a lot of good things that the church can cooperate and partner with to see us transform the city. And so one of these things, um, Annie, Annie was praying, and she received this, uh, a prophetic word, which we're actually going to pray a, a, or play a short snippet of it, just a couple min- minutes of it, while Annie comes up. And I want her to share this opportunity that... Initially, it, it involves her leading, but, but she, she just started to, like her vision started to explode. And it's like, I, I can connect the church body to this, and we could do this together. So why don't you just pr- play that, that short snippet of the prophetic word, Nanny, why don't you come up here? Can I have a mic? We're really going to play it. Having words for the city. We, we, I feel we, like we God really, is really going to give you strategic. 
speakers going to come and really increase um, and just having words for the city. I feel like God is going to give you strategic words for this city and the move that's coming and the transformation that's coming. Um, God's going to give you uh, strategic words that can be spoken over the city, that can be prayed over the city. Um, and I even just feel like within the city there's going to be regions like blocks of areas that man have been known for not good things, but he's going to give you words that are going to, that are going to change that around, that are going to, like, I just feel like it's going to, it's going to flip it on its head as you begin to speak into that, as you begin to speak into neighborhoods, as you begin to um, uh, speak into communities. Um, I even just feel like God's going to give you words to break off, like, um, things from drug dealers and addiction areas. There's areas of the city that um, God's got words that he's going to give you, going to break those things off of areas. And it's just, um, uh, those br those words are going to bring restoration. So I feel like God's saying you're a woman who, who's going to be a woman of restoration uh, to this city, to this city, a, a woman of power in this city, a woman unleashed in this city by the word of God. Um, um, and so nothing's over yet. Pathetic to ask. Uh, I saw while she was praying, the Lord putting keys in your hand. And I just feel like uh, with what she was saying, I, feel, I saw the Lord releasing keys uh, to this, like to those, um, to those problems. Like He was releasing keys, uh, like to uh, what would win the drug dealer's heart and like the neighborhoods. And so I'm just gonna put these in your hand because uh, they're keys. Uh, so as a prophetic act, uh, Lord, we just believe that you're releasing. Now, sometimes when we receive a prophetic word, it's like, how do we? How do we connect to it? What does it mean? That's when, that's when you have to learn how to steward prophetic words because oftentimes when we get a prophetic word, it's not specifically clear. You might get some specifics or you'll get specifics and like, well, how do I apply that now? You, ha you have to begin to pray over that, that word and cultivate it. And, and initially, Annie didn't have specifics, but you know, she makes herself available through work in her, in her career. And I'm going to just have her share a little bit about how that prophetic word spoke into something that's been presented and opened up to her. Yeah, so um, I was at work one day, and while I was at work, I got an email. And the email talked about this really great opportunity um, here in the city. And um, I, opened, I looked at the email, I saw what it was about, and it was very scary. It was very frightening. And I thought, Lord, there's no way I could do this. And... Um, I kind of put it to the side for like a week, and then the person said, hey, are you going to do this? Um, I saw this, and I thought of you, and I feel like you would be the right person for this. And this is somebody who works at my job. They know of the things that I've done at the job. The Lord has opened the door at my job to be able to bring in Christians that um, – have businesses, they have um, talents and abilities and creativity, and um, it has just exploded at my job, and I've been very purposeful in bringing the church into um, the workplace. And so I said, okay, um, I put together a resume and I submitted it. And um, I thought, well, I'll just throw something together and maybe they won't even bother to reach out to me. But I got the phone call saying, we want to interview you. So I go in, I get interviewed, and then um, I thought, well, they probably not going to want me to do this. And a week and a half later after praying, um, and I thought, it's really important to pray. And if it's not God, to say, Lord, close this door. If yeah. it's not you, you know, it was something exciting um, but scary at the same time. But I also wanted to take it to God in prayer to make sure it was of him. A week and a half later, sure enough, they said, we want you. Well, the opportunity that I've received is to be the guest program coordinator at the Memorial Art Gallery to plan the events that will take place from one of their largest events in February, which is their Black History Celebration Series. This past February, they had 600 people come out and participate. Amen. So I am responsible for coordinating these events for February 2020. And 
I'm like, oh my God, you've given me an entire memorial art gallery in our community for our people here in our community. And it started with an act of obedience at my job when the Lord said, invite Richmond Futch to come and do prophetic art. And I said, Lord, I can't tell these people that I have somebody from my church that do prophetic art during worship. You trying to get me fired. And you know what God said? He said, I gave you the job. Do what I asked you to do. Amen. And I did it. And it all started from one act of obedience. That prophetic word came, and I didn't know what it was going to look like or how it was going to come to pass. And when I said yes to having Richmond come, the, the door opened, and I continued to have more people come. But he's been setting me up, <clears throat> and he's been positioning me. Um, my job, they send me to different galas and events that are extravagant. But he's been positioning me and bringing me around the different people in the city of Rochester, presidents and CEOs and all these big business people. Um, I just got through graduating from a really big, well-known leadership development program that my job paid for. But it's God, he's been strategically lining me up and positioning me. And so... Um, I'm ecstatic, I'm scared as all get out, <laughs> um, because like, literally um, I am responsible for literally planning and coordinating. I have the entire art gallery to do the work of God, and so I will be bringing the church together with the world and our community, um, because it's bigger than me, it's not about me, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still like in shock and awe, in shock and awe. The least likely person, the least likely person that he used at my job, that all they know about me is the little bit that they've seen from what I've done at my job. So I'll be working with the mayor's office and different churches and organizations, the relationships that I've built um, within the community. And it's so funny, when I sat with Pastor David to talk about this, all the people that I was already sitting down to have talks with, he was like, oh, you should invite this one. Oh, you should have that one. Oh, you should have this one. It was just like confirmation of what God is doing. Um, and so I'm excited. I'll be working with Richmond again. I'll be hopefully working with Pastor Ron C and Bethel Express and our flag ministry. Like, I really want the body of Christ to really come together on that day to really take this city, take the city back. Awesome. And that's really what it's all about. I quickly want to just read a quick insert from our Draw the Circle prayer and 40 day fast that we're doing. Um, and it's from day 20. And it says, it's the title of Go Set Ready. And um, why not? There's an old adage, ready, set, go. And I know it's predicted, um, predicated on the importance of preparation. But I think it's backwards. You'll never be ready. You'll never be set. Sometimes you just need to go for it. The sequence of faith is this. Go set ready. Some people spend their entire lives getting ready for what God wants them to do, but they never end up doing it. Because they never come to the realization that they'll never be ready. This is where so many of us get stuck. Our failure to act on what we know God is calling us to do not only breathes doubt and discouragement, it's a form of disobedience. Mm. And like I said before, one act of, dis of obedience to invite rich men has really set things in motion. And what I want to say is if God is giving you a vision, if God has called you to do something, I don't care how scary it is. I don't care how frightening it is. 
Go walk through that door. You, it's, you never know what God is going to do. You never know what's on the other side. And so I would say step into it. Uh, grab hold of the vision that God is giving you and go for it. It's so funny. It was two years ago that I got that prophetic word. It was two years that I said to um, invited Richmond. And in February 2020, it will be three years. Jesus rose on the third day. And so I am just like so ecstatic and so excited and just um, in awe of what God is doing. So Amen. walk Amen. in your destiny and your purpose. Thank you, Annie. Exciting stuff. Yeah. What's that? Absolutely. We're going to pray for her. Lord, we just thank you for these opportunities that you throw in our lap. We're not even, we're not often even looking for these things. We're just, we're just saying, Lord, use us. And, and often you'll use us and we'll think, there? You want to use us there? And just by our act of obedience and our step of faith, you begin to cause something to rise up in us. And the things that we don't have, you bring to us through other people. So, Lord, we thank you for Annie's faithfulness. And we thank you that your promise is, is, is to complete the work in us. And you have a work for all of us to do. So, Lord, we pray blessing over this work. And, Lord, I, I spoke this to you when we talked, we're gonna, that, that number's going to double. It's going to be 1,200 because God's going to give you favor, favor as you lead this. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, Annie. Thank you. Isn't that awesome? You know, so she said, she said three years. Remember one of the principles that I, that I covered that I touched on with regards to vision? You know, sometimes, uh, you know, oftentimes we, we have to go through this period we have to wait. We have to rust, rest and we have to trust God. If you're, if you're anything like me, you want to rush headlong into it and, and do it on your own. And, and then you'll get the glory for that. But you, you have to wait. You have to often wait on the Lord. And, and I can't, it's just happened to me multiple times in my life where God will give me this picture or a glimpse or a dream or a word and confirm it through a prophetic word. And it doesn't happen until years later. One of them was to be the pastor of this church. When, when the Lord spoke to me about this, my mind was not there, my heart was not there, my spirit was not there. It, I mean, it, it could make sense in the sense that my dad was the senior pastor, but if you knew me and knew where I was and the desires and passions that I had, it, it, it did not look like the right fit. And I questioned God about it, but I knew that it was his, his voice speaking to me. So I just said, okay, God, you're going to have to do this thing because I can't make this happen. I can't, I can't cause those giftings to rise up in me. I don't feel like I have them, and I didn't. But, but the Lord just did something in me. So, you know, you all have that, you all have vision. You have, you have purpose. You have dreams that are locked inside of you. Be patient. Be patient. But when the Lord tells you to act and do something, you better act. Or you can delay that thing. You know, there is a time of waiting, but when he says move, then you got to move. And often he'll tell you to move, and you'll think, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to invite Richmond, Mutz, Rick, Richmond Futz to do prophetic painting at my, at my job. You know, it will often be things like that because God responds to our faith, not logic. Our faith, it will, it will stretch the parameters of our logic and practical thinking. So, Amen. Well, Lord, we, just, uh, we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this word this morning. I'm going to touch on some of the things that I shared about last week with regards to vision because you've given us all dreams and visions. If we don't have one, you want to give us that. So as we draw close to you and we seek you, you're going to begin to hardwire vision in us. You're going to communicate vision to us so that you tell us why we are here, why you exist, because no one's an accident. We all have purpose. You knew us before we were conceived in our mother's womb, so you have destiny written in our DNA even if we don't, haven't wrapped our minds around it. So, Lord, I pray that you would do something in all of us. If, if we lack little focus, if we're a little confused about where we're at, our, our position in life, Lord, I pray that you'd bring clarity, that you would bring revelation, um, even, even during this service, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to just touch on some of the things last week because if you weren't here... There's no way to get it because it wasn't recorded. And we, have problem, we had problems with our live stream. So if, you, if you've tried to find it in the archives and it's not there, it's not my fault. It's not their fault. 
it was our, our computers were getting updated and our live stream went down, so we couldn't we couldn't actually record it. But we're actually making provisions uh, like a backup plan to, if that happens again. But uh, if you weren't here, I do want to do want to share some of the things that I touched on last week when I talked about stewarding vision. Um, when I talk about vision, I'm not just talking about any old vision, any. It, because th- there's, there's a lot of vision that the world has, and they can accomplish things. They could set goals and accomplish those goals, and it, and it bears fruit. I'm talking about godly vision. I'm talking about the overarching cause and purpose of why we are here as sons and daughters of God. That touches on your work and your play and your extracurricular activities. It touches on all of those things. But God, God has given vision for every single individual in this room. Part of the vision, I believe, is being connected to this body, your local congregation. This is, this is why I get on people when I find out, you know, well, we're going to church. We're going to church online. I'm like, but are you connected to the body of Christ? Are you connected to a church body? Because you will never accomplish what God has for you alone. As a lone ranger, you need tanto. I wonder what tanto means. This is, you, you, need, you need people. You need the body of Christ to, 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 to be able to accomplish the thing that God has for you. But the vision has to come from God himself. And that's like hard for some of us. It's like we, we question, is this from God? I believe as you develop intimacy in a relationship with the Lord, there'll be no confusion as to what voice you're hearing. The enemy speaks, but you should be able to discern when the enemy speaks. And oftentimes the enemy speak might it might be through other people. It might be through good people to dissuade you from the crazy thing that God just told you to do. My, my feeling is if it's crazy, if it's out of this world, if it causes you to, to, to wear something different and act something different and maybe look ridiculous, it's probably God. That's just the way it works. Because you've got to do it in faith. If you think that you got it together and you're all equipped for it and you're dressed for it, then that doesn't take any faith. God doesn't get the glory for that kind, kind of move. Um, you have to bring it to life by writing it down or talking about it. Um, it's, it's what I shared last week. I never shared what I shared la- last week before in front of the congregation. I don't believe I did. Certainly not with my, with, with my heart connected to it. And you, you have to bring it to life. There, there are times where you just you don't say anything. You ever, you ever experience that where God gives you a word, but you don't feel like this release to share it? Well, you're not supposed to. You're supposed to pray over it. God's just telling you, listen, you need to pray over this. You need to steward it. But at some point, you got to communicate it or nothing ever happens. God's pleased when we respond in faith and we put put action to our faith. You know, faith without works is dead. we got to work out our faith somehow, and it should have some sort of visible representation. It's got to come to life in the natural. And you can't develop vision in a vacuum which is exactly what Annie was talking about. You can't develop it in a vacuum. If the vision's going to develop, you have to talk to people about it. You have to start writing it down and praying about it and breaking it apart and and figuring, well, 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 Lord, I I, I know I can do this, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to start here. And then you you, you can't get impatient when the the vision is delayed. I'm somebody that gets impatient when the vision is, is, is delayed. And I think that's why God keeps it so, like, unclear to me. If I make it too clear, he's just going to, like, run into it and fall off the cliff or something. So I, I think he just gives me pieces of it because he knows I'll steward the piece. And then he brings other pieces. And often it's, it's he'll bring people in my life. I, I'm just praying, Lord, I don't know how you're going to accomplish this thing, but I trust you. And all of a sudden he brings these people in my life, which he's doing lately. It's crazy. I mentioned this thing last week. I experienced two different emotions. One I'll share about in a minute, but the other, the other was excitement because people begin to come and share. I've, I've had this vision for years. And, and people that, that could make something like this happen. So don't get impatient, and, and the Lord will establish your steps. Psalms 37, 23 through 24 says, The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall. For the Lord upholds his hand. He will establish your path. Did you hear that? He will establish your path. 
You have to let him establish the path, not you. Don't try to figure out how God is going to do it. Let him tell you how he's going to do it and then do it when he tells you to do it. Let him establish the path. So that was briefly what I touched on last week. I want to talk to you this morning about how to contend for vision, how to, how to stand strong in faith. We've, um, we've had some challenges this week. We've had some family that have had challenges this week. We had somebody that's part of our family who, um, who, whose daughter ended up in the hospital in a critical condition. There was no activity in her brain, and she, she passed on and she went to be with the Lord. Now, we lose battles, but we will not lose the war. The ultimate victory, victory has been guaranteed. And Anastasia, whose, whose name it means resurrection, this stuff is not easy to talk about. I'd like to come and tell you, you know, we were warring for her and she, was, and she resurrected. I mean, that's the story that I want. If, if we would be honest, that's the story that the family, that's, a, that's what the family wanted. And she would be healed and she rose and she, and, and she was well. But that didn't happen. You know, in this life, we are not guaranteed that we're going to get out of it without skin knees, without collateral damage. We've all experienced this. And we've all experienced prayers that were answered in the way that we wanted them. But that doesn't mean that we, we stop fighting because if we, if we stop fighting, then, then all the battles are going to be lost. We, at, we ask the Lord, that you, Lord, give us, give us strategy on how to win the next one. And uh, so uh, we, we just pray for... Melina and, and her kids, um, I'm just going to pray for them now. Melina, Lord, we just ask your peace. And I know, because there's been communications with, with her and I in the past couple days, I know that your peace is on that family. And I know that it wasn't your will. You didn't take Anastasia. You didn't take her. She was taken from us, but you didn't take her. We realize that we are in the midst of a battle. And that we as your soldiers have to learn how to fight and in, in, in be involved in that battle. So this is not on you. Um, Lord, I pray that you would give us more clarity, more revelation, more power, that the giftings would flow, from, flow through us so, so that, that, that we would see the outcome that we, we so desire. But Lord, I know this, that Anastasia is resurrected. She, she, she was your daughter. When she was 12 years old, she, she made you Lord of her life. And we know that she's with you in heaven today. So we're thankful for that. But Lord, help us to, to learn how to fight this battle here so the enemy doesn't win and get his way. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. When I'm talking about contending faith and contending for the vision, stuff like that can start to sway you, frustrate you, rock your faith. If you're not close to the Lord in seasons like that, the enemy will have his way with you. It will, it will shipwreck your faith. It will cause you to project on God everything that you experience. And, and the enemy will come into your life and he'll start to feed you lies about who Father God is. That, well, maybe he's not good. Maybe he didn't want her to live. Maybe he really did take her. But that's when, that's when the enemy comes into our life, if we're, not, if we're not close to him and stay intimate with him. So we, we need to pray for the family that they would be guarded against that, that they would be close to Father God in this, in this season. So this is why it's so important to contend for vision because stuff comes our way that's painful, that will sway us from the things that God has for us. I want to talk about three opposers to, vi- to, to, um, to vision. And by the way, my, my spell checker kept trying to correct a poser. But it's a word. It's a, I don't know what the deal was. I tried to spell it five different ways, and it still kept rejecting it, and it's still highlighted in red. But there are three opposers to vision. And um, I'm not going to talk about the devil and his minions, because he's a lion and he roars, but he's just noisy and he has no teeth. I don't really worry about him in the sense that he is not going to come at you as a physical lion. He's going to come at you through these three opposers that I want to talk about. And I don't want to give him a whole lot of credit. Because really, he has no more power than we give him. He's powerless if we make him powerless by positioning ourselves 
to be people of faith. So I'm not going to talk about that, but certainly the enemy comes in and uses these three things to oppose us and oppose vision. One, what, what do you think the first one is? You. You. We get in our own way. We're the first opposer. As a matter of fact, I think we as individuals can be the primary problem because we have a small view of us or we have a small view of God. As you draw close to him, this is why we stress being in prayer, being in the word, studying the word, having that intimate time, you know, being in that secret place. Like Remember I talked about being on the rampart, you know, getting away from the noise, getting away from people, getting away from family and spending time in the, with, with the Lord, developing intimacy. It, it, it's because if you don't do that, you will get in your way. You will get in your way. You will immediately default to what you're good at in the natural. And I, that will often lead you astray because that is the path of least resistance. God puts you on a path, it's a narrow one. It's the path that has resistance because he knows it builds strength and it builds trust. The relationship is about trust. That's what faith is. You have strong faith, it means you trust God. You trust God at his word and who he is and what the Bible says about him and the promises that he has for you. Our own lack of faith is the first opposer we meet and we have to contend for that faith. In 1 Timothy 1.18, it says, This command I commit to you, my son Timothy, according to the prophecies that were previously given to you, that by them you might fight the good fight. You have to fight the good fight. I think some of you have laid down. You're not fighting anymore. Some of you might even be sleeping and swinging in the hammock. You're not fighting. You have to always be engaged in the battle. There should never be a lull. That doesn't mean that you're always on the defense and you're all stressed out and you have full of, you're full of anxiety. No, it just means that you're always plugged in. You're never lazy spiritually. When you get lazy spiritually, you get on a basketball court and you have somebody throw the ball at your face that's happened to me before, and you lose composure, and you blow your witness. Fighting the fight of faith means you're always ready. You're always ready for the unpredictable things that happen in your life to have a godly response. To to trade love and patience for anger. These are not small things. It's why the New Testament spends so much time talking about the character that he wants to develop in us. The fruits of the Spirit that he wants to develop in us. Those things are so key. They are more important than the gifts that he wants to give you. You will never steward the gifts that he wants to give you unless you don't learn to display the character of God. Amen? You have to walk by faith. The only way to contend for vision that God has given you is by learning to walk in faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we do not walk by sight. You don't use sight, physical sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. Nothing God-given is accomplished without faith. Nothing. Everything that you acquire spiritually, every area that you grow in, every gift that you gift is, is acquired through faith. Through faith. That's it. Not because you deserve it, not because you practice it well. It's, it's, it's acquired to you and accumulated by acts of faith, by believing and trusting God. I have a formula for you. Everyone loves formulas. Vision plus faith equals success. God will give you vision, but the only way that you'll execute that vision, do that thing that God has called you to do, is if you do it through faith, not by sight. In other words, God will use your physical senses, your five senses. He'll use them, but it'll always be connected to your heart in your spirit, because your heart and your spirit is, 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 is to feed that vision. What is faith? It is not emotional and mental confidence. You know, you look up dictionary definitions of faith, it will talk about like a human confidence because of experience or something like that. That is not what faith is. 
Faith is confidence in God. It's not confidence in your experience or your experiences or people or your talents or your gifts. It is confidence in God. It's confident expectation that God will do what he says he's going to do. This is why you need to know the vision's from God. Because if the vision's from God, it's like, oh, that's a lot easier. God's going to accomplish this thing in my life. If you know it's from God, then you can have the confident expectation that he's going to do that thing. He places vision in your heart. Faith is confidence, I love this, faith is confidence in his nature, in his words about who he is and who you are. Who God says you are. Not your self-limiting beliefs, but who God says you are. How do you know what God says you are? You look in the word. There are all sorts of promises. He talks to his kids in his word. And he talks to you as you develop intimacy with him. He will tell you who you are. And it's not what everybody else says that you are or you are not. We have built so much of our lives about what other people think of us and what people, other people say about us. We become so fixated on that, so connected to that, we never move into that new thing of God because we're being dragged and hindered by all those self-limiting beliefs and all those words that have been spoken over you. You need to know what God says about you. Faith comes from the heart. Listen to this passage of Scripture. I heard this twist on the Scripture. It's powerful. 2 Corinthians 3.15. Yes, even today, when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with a veil, and they do not understand. It says, he was talking about the Israelites and how, their, how the Lord actually covered their hearts with a veil, and they could not understand who Jesus was. In other words, there's a veil in people's hearts. For, for people who, who don't have Jesus in their lives, in Lord of their lives, there's a veil over their heart, therefore they lack understanding. What that scripture implies is that it comes from your heart first, then you get understanding. Understanding doesn't come first. The vision comes from here in your being, then gets into your head. If it gets into your head first, you'll talk yourself out of it. It's got to come through here, through your spirit, man. And then you gain understanding. That's what faith is. I will not, I can't cling to stuff that I come up with. I'll talk myself out of it. If it's an idea that really stretches me, I will talk myself out of it. Because I will immediately look in the natural, at my natural abilities, I can't do that thing. As a matter of fact, that person over there, they could do it better than me. But if it comes from here, it doesn't matter what I think I have natural abilities for. God will accomplish that thing if I know it's a word from the Lord. We need to start operating out of here instead of out of here. It doesn't mean God doesn't use it, but he will speak to our heart, to our spirit first, then we use the natural giftings. Because you have to submit your flesh You have to submit to your your natural thinking to the Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit that's in you. That's your Holy Spirit communes with your spirit. That's what being filled with the Spirit is. Someone once said, questions with trust lead to revelation and confidence. Questions with mistrust lead to unbelief. If you trust God, if you have intimacy with God, then you will trust him. And if you trust him, you'll hear his voice, you'll know his voice, and you'll do what he said that you can do. And that builds belief. And belief affects that, and it affects our entire life. But if we don't trust God, if we have mistrust, this is why we talk about Father God. We want you to have a proper lens and a proper picture of who Father God is. He's Abba Father. He's a loving Father. He's not a cruel father. He's not a father that punishes. And because of Jesus in the new covenant, it's just even better. But he's always been that way. He's unchanging in that sense that he's always been loved. God is love, but God loves you. If you have a view that God loves you and God's not waiting for you to screw up so he can punish you or put you in the corner, he's somebody that wants to promote you. And in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the failure, if we we say, God, Forgive me, 
I know I'm still your son. I'm like the prodigal son, and I'm coming home, and you're waiting with, with open arms. And you, and, you, and you know what it means to be restored? The church gets this wrong, too. When somebody falls, when a leader falls, or somebody important in a ministry falls, we want to punish them. They should experience consequences. There needs to, needs to be proper restoration. And you, need to, and you need to know, especially depending on who that leader is, whether that leader's been properly, properly restored and is walking with people and is, is accountable. But oftentimes the church never puts that person back in that original position. That's not restoration in God's eyes. That's not, re- that's not what redemption is. Restoration is, is, is that person being elevated by God back to that original position. That's restoration in God's eyes. That's what he wants to do. He wants to make us all ambassadors, all sons, all kings, all priests. God faith is accompanied by action. James 2.17 says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And then also, when you have faith, and God's given you a word, you need to decree it. That's what Hector's word was talking about. He said, this is, this is a season of, of words. We need to be careful of our words because words have the power of life and death. The power of life and death is in our tongue. But when you have something, when you have a vision, and God wants you to communicate it, you need to decree it. You need to get it out there. That's what I did last Sunday. I, I knew that it, I, I can't keep this in anymore. I have to decree that thing. And it will begin to take life. It forms into something. That's, visible, that's a visible, visible representation of faith and acting out your faith. The second opposer is who? Who? Come on, be brave. Step out in faith. It's other people. Other people can be a part of your vision. I'm not saying that you need to run around suspicious. I wonder if that's one of those opposers. I'm not saying that you should do that. But you need to be aware that people will often oppose the vision that God gives you. Because it's even crazy to them. Any this thing that's been presented to her has very little to do with her job. It's not even connected directly to their job. It really does not make sense. And you, you share stuff like that with friends who are, who are you're not like covenant friends, who are praying for you, who, are, who, are, who, who, who have relationship with you. You know, they'll say, I'd pass on that. that. That might not even serve you well in work. You start bringing more church people around, you are going to get fired. You know, you, you can have all, you know, all the believers say that. You've got to be careful who you communicate that, that vision to. Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his own town. You think about this. Jesus, the Son of God. The Son of God. i got music playing. I have theme music. <laughs> Answer that phone, will you? It might be God wanting to share vision for your life. <clears throat> Jesus himself was not welcome in his own town, the Son of God. Somehow there was something in him that made him un- un- unwelcome, not because of what was in, in, in him, but because of what was in them. There was, there was a spirit of familiarity. That spirit's in your friends sometimes. There's a spirit of familiarity. When God wants to do this new thing in you, they're like, you don't got that. I've known you, and you were, you were, you, you'll mess this up. You're going to mess this up. It's that spirit of familiarity that gets in your friend. We've got to pray against that in, in us. You know, that it's the spirit of presumption, the way we think God's going to move in us or move in somebody else. We've got to be careful about that. Jesus' friends and family rejected the idea that he was the Messiah. You know, it doesn't... It doesn't elaborate a whole lot on this, but it appears that he had, Jesus had five siblings, at least five siblings, probably more, but at least five siblings. But it says nothing about them being disciples pre-crucifixion. His mother even struggled with belief in who he was, but it doesn't say anything about the siblings. 
He had to die and get resurrected from the dead in order for the, his, his siblings to jump on board. But that happens. You know what I call friends who aren't willing to get out of the boat with you? They're boat people. Boat people. They like to stay in the boat. You know, Peter, you could say a lot about Peter. You can say, well, it was arrogance. No, I don't think it was that at all. I think it was his love and his trust in Jesus, and he's the one that got out of the boat in the storm. The water wasn't calm. He got out of the boat in the storm because he trusted Jesus. And all the other peeps, all the other disciples, the boat people, they stayed in the boat. You're going to have to leave the boat people in your life in the boat. That doesn't mean that you reject them as friends and that you ignore them. But oftentimes when the Lord tells you to do something, you're going to be alone at times doing it, just you and him. Hector's, again, touching on Hector's words. You've got to get away from toxic tribes. You've got to get away from toxic people. That, I'm not talking about church people there. There are some times where you have to, and by the way, you're allowed to judge each other's fruits. I know we don't talk about this much, but if we love each other and we're family, we don't leave things unattended if we see something in one of our brothers and sisters' lives that could be detrimental to them. We go to them quietly. You don't go to the pastor and say, hey, I heard about so-and-so. I'm just coming to you because I want to pray for them. But I heard that, you know, so-and-so said this or is, is doing this. The first thing, when people go there, when I get people in my office and they start to, drop, like, drop names, I, t- I say, stop! Stop, stop, stop! You have a responsibility to go to them. If they've offended you, you got an ax to grind with them, you go to them and you deal with it. And you can, you can bring me along later on if things don't pan out very well, but you need to deal with this directly. Amen. The third opposer is lack of resources. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. If God gives you vision, he's going to give you provision. That might be one of the litmus tests that it ain't God's vision. The provision's not there. It also might be because you're not looking to God for the provision. You're trying to muster it up on your own. You're trying to figure out how you can do it. If God gives you a vision, he'll give you the provision. Romans 12, 2 says, Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing, perfect will is. You have to test that thing. Make sure it's, it, it's, it's God's will for you. Make sure it's God's word. And if you test it and you know it, don't back down. Don't let any of these things come and oppose it. There's a principle when it comes to provision that is a godly spiritual principle that we can apply and we can directly benefit from, and that's the principle of sowing and reaping. It's powerful. You sow a specific seed, you will bear the fruit of that specific seed. I've, I've practiced this time and time in my life. Have you ever met a generous person? Yes? They tend to attract generous people, don't they? Whatever you give off, whatever you display, you will attract in kind. You will attract people like that. It's the law of attraction. Simply put, you give what you get, and you get what you give. This is why when we tell people who are in financial crisis, first of all, you need to know the Lord. You need to draw into him and begin to get instructions and guidance from him. But secondly, if you're in financial crisis, give financially. That's what I've done. Because what does that do? First of all, it defies logic. It defies your senses. This does not make sense. Well, but I'm going to trust God. He says, to give and it will be given to you. I mean, that's what the Bible says. If you don't like what I'm saying, that's fine, but that's what the Bible says. Give and it will be given to you. Reap and you will sow. And how many believers in here have practiced that? You sowed what you didn't have, what you lacked because you needed it. How many? Wave your hand high. 
and it's worked. Yes? Maybe not all the time, maybe not the way that you expect, but, but, it, but it works. And it works all the time, but it, you know, sometimes it's just not in the way that we expect. So I'm going to close with this. We're, we're in this place of, um, in the natural, it could look like lack. I'm not discouraged by it anymore. You know, we've shared with you that we wanted to expand ministry and, and do things to the building, but we lack the finances to do it. So here I am preaching to you all the time and telling you what to practice and how you need to, you need to sow seed and all that. And I'm like, I, I felt like convicted by the Holy Spirit. It's like, well, then you do it as a body, not me individually. I, I do that individually. I faithfully give. I practice the principle of the tithe, and I, and I do more than that. And I'm not saying that to boast on it. I'm saying I'm your leader, and I will never tell you to do something that I don't practice myself. That's important that you know that, and I communicate that. But, you know, we as a church body, I know that God has more for us, and that's going to take resources. It's going to take finances. It's going to take people. It's going to take giftings. None of that will be accomplished. None of it will be accomplished unless we learn to sow seed. So they don't know that I'm doing this. There, there's a couple that I met probably a year ago. They've been pastoring a church for five years. And they are visionaries. They have kingdom vision. And God, I think, is intimately connected, Charles and I, to them. And I believe in what they're doing. Their names are oop, Pastor Melvin and Ashley Cross. Some of you know who they are. But they are special, unique, talented individuals. Can you put the picture up on, on the screen? Aren't they handsome? I have good-looking friends. That's Melvin and Ashley Cross. They have a house called Glory House International. They meet on exchange, but they don't meet in their own building. And they have a vision to be in their own building. And uh, so I decided, well, you know, we have lack. We have need. I'm going to sow some seed. So Ashley and Melvin are going to be watching this later on because they don't know what's happening. And they're going to see the congregation get up and put an offering to contribute to their building fund. And I will tell you that I'm putting the first $100 in there. All right? As seed for what I believe that God wants to do in my life and in the body here. Amen? Can we pray over this? Lord, I thank you for Melvin and Ashley. And I thank you for the vision that, that you have given them. It's so connected to the vision that we have. And Lord, their, their extended family, they meet in a different building, but they're still part of the church. And I think that you have strategically and uniquely connected us together. Their kindred hearts and kindred spirits and their, their humility and their gifting oozes out of them. So Lord, I appreciate them and I appreciate the gifting that you've given them And Lord, I believe in them and I believe in the work that they have. So much so that I want us to benefit from what they're doing and what they're a part of. So we're going to sow seed into their ministry and into their their building program so they can get into that building that you've called them to be in because they need that building. For the vision that they have, they need that building. Not just that building. They need other buildings. (laughs) But they need that building that they can call home. You You know how important geographical locations are to the Lord? When you think, think about that. When God created mankind, didn't he put him somewhere? He put him in a garden. And when mankind didn't like the garden anymore, he tried to bring them to a land, to the promised land. Land is important. A geographical location is important to the Lord because it testifies of his goodness. It's where, it's where you get planted. It's your, it's your place. It's your tribe. Your, your tribe needs a place to meet. You know, so buildings are important. Because I believe it's a place that God manifests his glory. And it's a place that people can call home that don't have a home. So Lord, I pray over their their building program. I pray, Lord, that you would bless the works of their hands. That you would expand their influence. That you would do great and mighty things through them. And as, as we begin to connect with them, we get the benefit from it. And they get the benefit from the relationship that's, that's being developed here. 
So Lord, we thank you for all that you're going to do at Glory House International and all that you're going to do through Beth, at Bethel Christian Fellowship and all the things that we're going to do together and that every individual in this sanctuary is part of. And we thank you, Lord, and we bless you and we ask that you would just continue to bless us in, the, in, in our works, the works of our hands and our hearts in Jesus' precious name. Amen.